All right, guys, welcome back to another episode on the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. We have the legendary Seth Godin with us. Seth, how you doing? I'm great. I'll start with a question to uh, listeners. Have you ever seen Eric and Chris at the same time? Because <laughs> it's quite possible they're just using digital trickery to make you think there are two of them. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I love it. And I know once, um, right before I hit the record button, you were just saying, now this is interesting. Who's who? So we had some fun with that. So I have to ask you, Seth, have you ever been interviewed by twins? Probably. I've done a lot of interviews, but you guys are really, you've upped the game with the sunglasses. For sure. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. We, we got to protect these eyes, you know, at this young age. You. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on, Seth. Uh, honestly, this is a really, this is a treat for us. I mean, we have a lot of respect for you. We followed a lot of your work in the past and continue to do so. So I want to just get right into this. So let's start off with uh, what we call rapid dynamic questions. You ready for that? Ready. Okay. So huge billboards all around. Let's say you were in, you're in New York. Yes, sir. Okay, so if you could have the billboard, you know, a billboard in New York, tons of traffic going by every single day, what would that say on the billboard? Oh, so there's a lot to learn about billboards. Jay Levinson famously said that the very best billboard of all time would say, free coffee, next exit. And the reason is that the purpose of a billboard is to have as few words as possible, to reach the largest possible number of people, and to offer something that satisfies very short-term needs. And I think all three things are a mistake. And billboards are not a metaphor for the kind of work we ought to be doing. That there's no question a billboard will reach more people for less money than almost anything you can do. But there's also no question that billboards don't work if you're trying to educate, connect, or lead a small group of people who actually care. Right, I like it. Now, Seth, you are a producer of content. When you consume content, how do you prefer that? Audio, uh, through reading, through video? Yeah, I think that we have a, a big challenge because the media companies have pushed us to forget about the medium and instead to obsess about uh, attention or these people they call friends who aren't really our friends or likes that aren't really likes. Um, it needs to fit the bucket properly. So I don't want to read comics in the newspaper, because that's just a bad way to get comics into my hands. And I don't want to read a book in a blog, because a book has a magical function to it. And the fact that all 200 pages are next to each other, and you can hand it to somebody else, that's what the medium is good for. One of the things that people have wrestled with over the months with the pandemic, is they think they can jam a meeting into Zoom. But Zoom isn't just a replacement for a meeting, it's a different thing. If you do it right, it's better. If you do it worse, it's a, it's a mistake. Right. Absolutely. What is your top two skill sets that every uh, entrepreneur should learn? Well, I would say the first one is understanding that skills are way more important than talents. And I talk about this a lot in my new book, but talents are something you're born with and we're born with almost nothing. Uh, maybe we're born with a brother ready to go, but in general, we don't know how to walk. We don't know how to talk. Those are all skills. So if there's a skill you need, you can go get it. And the second thing I would say is that enrollment is the key. If you want to go somewhere, you're more likely to get there than if you're going along for, some, for the ride. And in school, we were taught to do it because we were told to do it. But once you're not in school anymore, you should do it because you want to do it. Mm. Love it. Finish the sentence. The world currently needs more of peace of mind and justice. Ah, love that. What's your go-to tip to stay focused? What? Oh, is that a puppy? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, focus is not my area of expertise. Uh, I think that there are hunters and there are farmers and uh, for a very, very long time, everyone on earth was a hunter uh, for a million years. And being a hunter requires different skills than being a farmer. And we had a 500-year run for farmers where you get good at sitting still and focusing and um, making tiny incremental improvements. But in a world that moves so fast where trends and, and uh, habits and things that rhyme show up, 
those old skills of being able to notice just a little bit of a, a movement in the bush, um, that might be worthwhile too. So I'm not good at staying focused. Sorry. Gotcha. I love the honesty. I love the honesty. Seth, what keeps you up at night these days? Well, I'm 60. That's pretty much all you need to know. Um, I I assume you mean metaphorically. Metaphorically, uh, I think that the world has become aware of how much trauma, uh, how much widespread trauma, how much injustice, how much disrespect, uh, how many missed opportunities whether it's racial justice or the carbon debt that we are in. And um, I think in small groups, human beings are good at dealing with all of that. And in big groups, particularly anonymous groups, we're terrible at it. And I'm hopeful that the small group mindset will kick in. Yep. If there is any other profession that you could do, what would that profession be and why? Well, I started as a canoeing instructor. And so I have made everything I do a version of that, except there's no boat and there's no lake. But whatever it is that I was going to pick was going to involve helping see where people are and helping them get to where they want to go. Um, And I think that that's pretty universal. Uh, I'm not ready to sign up to be an Orange Grove owner or to be a surgeon because I would be bad at both of those. Um, But in between those, you know, I, I've seen the work the two of you do. And the work the two of you do doesn't have to, doesn't spend a lot of time moving weights from one pile to the other. It's about helping see what's holding people back and helping people get to where they want to go. Yep. Yeah. All right, Seth. So you are officially off the rapid questions hot seat. <laughs> okay, what do I win? <laughs> I don't know. Eric, Eric's the one that holds the prizes, so he'll, he'll, he'll tell you later. <laughs> I'll think about that one. <laughs> so, Seth, I want to start this off with just, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming the audience knows who you are and kind of like what your work is, is you know, based around. But I want to really kind of start this off with just the love that you have for marketing, right? And where did that love and like just that passion and that drive and just and why marketing out of all things? If it wasn't, I, you know, business development, if it wasn't sales, if it wasn't something else, but why marketing? Um. I have no love for marketing. And in fact, most marketing is uh, my arch enemy. I have redefined marketing and have used my leverage to make it so that people think who have paid attention that that's what marketing has always been. So marketing is an advertising or hype or hustle. It's not shortcutting. It's not selfish. It's not pushing people to do what you need them to do. We have other words to describe that. I define marketing as doing work that matters for people who care. It's the work of making things better in a way that you're proud of. And I got to call that marketing and people fell for it. So that's great because that's what I want to teach. Mm, Love that. And then with uh, everything, like let's, okay, so you're an author, entrepreneur, and I love how you say most importantly, you are a teacher. So where did that come from? Like, was that part of your upbringing? Were your your parents educators? Did they always push you to go seek just, you know, the traditional education or were they more of just like, Seth, I want you just to be able to just go seek all your goals and do whatever you want? Well, let's be clear that education and learning are not the same thing. Education is something that we do for compliance and uh, it's about coercion and you get a prize. That's how they get you to do what you're supposed to do. We invented education uh, to create enough compliant factory workers. And there are educators who are also teachers who help with learning, but there are a lot of educators that are simply uh, creators of an obedient system. And um, my parents, my grandparents, lots of people in my circle have been folks who helped with learning and never were particularly big fans of education. So I won the birthday lottery. I had great parents. I miss them every day. Uh, And they encouraged me not to follow my dreams. They encouraged me to do something to be of use. And I think that's a big distinction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I kind of want to just piggyback on that with just the education system, you know, because I've I've read a lot in your daily blogs that you do talk about like the current education system and it's broke. It's a broken model. So where do you see like the education system just going these days? You know, like because I feel too like just the whole model of like going to university is broken. Right. So where do you see everything kind of going and people adapting with just everything going on these days? 
Well, you know, you walked into a Sears Roebuck a few years ago, and you could look around and say, this place is bankrupt. They just don't know it yet. And uh, I think we're going to see 60% of all the colleges go out of business. Um, we're going to see, we already are seeing the fraud of virtual learning, which I don't like either one of those words or distance learning. It's distance education and it doesn't work because compliance isn't built into it. So there's going to be a huge boon in building compliance into remote education, but that will be horrible. Um, and then we're going to see, I think, this shift where parents who care are going to connect their kids to learning and projects and creation instead. And every once in a while, I talk about the Acton Academy, which is a growing chain of franchised uh, called schools. Uh, typical one has 50 to 100 kids in it and only two adults. Every kid is between five and, and 17. And the two adults, one includes the custodian. And the only rule is a, an adult will not tell you what to do. You got to figure it out every day, day after day. And if you look at what happens to kids in the Acton Academy, they figure it out. They figure out how to use the resources available to do things that they care about. And it's a complete game changer. Right. Now, I want to stick to kind of what you said about compliance, right, and education system. I want you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, what do you mean by just like compliance? Well, so you get to first grade, you sit in straight rows, you raise your hand when it's time to talk, you ask for permission to go to the bathroom. If you don't do well on the test, they reprocess you. They call that failing, and then you have to do it again another year. If you do that 12 years in a row and you've complied all the way with decent scores of quality, then you get picked to go to four more years, and then you get to go to the placement office where they reward you by giving you a job, which you then get to keep for 40 more years, except they broke the deal. And they broke the deal because no one's going to the placement office anymore. And they broke the deal because even if you get the job, you don't get to stay there for 40 years being doing what you're told. Because as soon as they can find a system that they can get done by a computer or outsourcing it, they do. And so anyone who has a job where they tell you what to do all day is in big trouble, big trouble. And now the system is looking for people who know what to do, who want to invent what to do. And we didn't teach them any of that in school. And so the system that was optimized to create factory workers who could handle obedience is no longer producing what we need. Right. And so what do you recommend like for people that have went through that system? You know, like I was born in 85, so I went through like that system. I went to university for five years and I could tell you that I didn't learn really anything coming out of that with a business and slash communication degree, as opposed to investing in mentorship and ex expediting that learning curve and actually putting in the work for 10 years of entrepreneurship. So what do you tell people that have gone through that broken model and they're just kind of like stumped? Like, what do I do now? If I can, if I only can obey to people telling me what to do on this to-do list every single day. First, you got to see it, right? You're seeing it. I, what, this is what I sell. I sell, do you see it? The subtitle of my book is Ship Creative Work. Well, almost nobody who's been through the system wants to ship work because you'll get blamed. Almost no one wants to be creative because you'll get blamed. And almost no one wants to do work because the goal of going to your job is to do as little as possible. People who make art, they don't say, oh, I think I'll hold back. I won't finish this play till later. Or I won't finish this painting till... No. They say, how do I do more of this? Because they're committed. They're enrolled in the journey. And so what we have to do first is sell enrollment. Sell people on the idea that it is possible for them to find joy in creation and in connection. And second, we have to sell people on the idea of becoming incompetent. Because you will momentarily become incompetent before you learn anything. Because in that moment, you realize you're doing it wrong, and then you learn to do it right. But if you're not willing to be incompetent, you're not willing to give up education, then you're stuck. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. So I want to talk about too, I still want to stay on this topic about marketing and storytelling. I know you're really big on storytelling. I mean, we're huge advocates of your, your daily blog, and you always mention that. And I think it's so true. And that's something we advocate to our fitness professional students when building a brand and putting themselves out there. So is there like a particular, you know, framework or step-by-step -step process that you have to like really get ahead and just craft your own story and you know, be able to put that out to people? 
Well, my colleague Bernadette Jiwa has the method, and she's written five or six best-selling books on the topic, J-I-W-A. Start with any of them. Um, but first, you have to understand story has nothing to do with kids' books. It has nothing to do with once upon a time. It has nothing to do with writing. Story is the oldest human technology. It is the way we communicate an idea to someone else. And, you know, let's just pick something like fitness. The fact is the difference between being incredibly fit like you guys and sort of fit like me will have no difference on our long-term longevity. We'll both live just as long. Nor will it have any difference really on our ability to haul heavy objects because I haul heavy objects by calling someone on the phone. And we now live in a world where you don't really get rewarded for hauling heavy objects. So what is the point of fitness? It's not what the point of fitness was in 1720 when you, if you can't outrun a jaguar, you're dead. It's something other than that. It's a story. It's a story we tell ourselves. It's a story we tell other people. We don't even have to tell it in words. It's a story about investing in oneself. It's a story about health. It's a story about sex and robustness. It's a story about commitment. And it communicates in a hundred different ways. And all of those pieces add up to the narrative we have about who we are and how we want other people to see us. And so I don't have a gym bumper sticker on my car. I have a Grateful Dead bumper sticker on my car. And they both serve the same purpose. They're just telling the people who are driving by, like, hey, I miss Jerry, is just like a bumper sticker that says, I ran a 26.1 marathon. It's this is who I am. Do you see me? Because I'm telling you a story. Right. Now, now, would you say, though, that, that storytelling is one of the most powerful like marketing assets that somebody can have? It's the only one. It is the no. only one. You know, if you say to people, this is a 99 cent store, that's a story because no one woke up this morning saying, I wish I could buy a piece of junk for 99 cents. They said, yeah, it's cheap. It's fun. I'll go see what they got. That's a story. If you... Uh, have a buzzer on the door of your store back in the day when people could go to stores, what's the buzzer for? The buzzer tells a story. It says certain people are being kept out of here and other people are being let in. And if you want to feel like one of us, see, go ahead, pre press the buzzer, see what happens. Yeah. And so they're all stories. And if a marketer doesn't see it, and doesn't understand it, you're like a goldfish who doesn't know there's water. It becomes very hard to do your work. Interesting. Yeah. It makes perfect I wanna, sense. Yeah. I, I want to shift gears here and talk about the 19 books that you've written. 19 books. I mean, Seth, <laughs> did you think that when you wrote book number one that you would sit there and almost be upon 20? Okay. So first of all, it's way easier to write a book than people think. First, you write a sentence. You do that eight times, you got a paragraph. You do that four times, you got a page. You do that 200 times, you got a book. Not hard. When I was a book packager, I did 120 books. I did a, a book a month for 12 years. And we sold millions and millions of books. I wrote books for kids. I wrote books for adults. I didn't write all the books. I hired people to write books. So by the time I wrote Permission Marketing, I knew how to write a book. What I didn't know how to do is sound like me. And so the hard work has been making my work rhyme, has been making it so that you can read any paragraph of any of my books and it sounds like me. And so the 20th book, which is out in November 4th, sounds like me more than any other book. And maybe it'll be a bestseller. Maybe it won't. That's not why I wrote it. Yep. I wrote it because I wanted to teach people something. And um, I've had books that have taken me eight, hour, eight hours a day for a year. And I've had books that I've written in three weeks. That's not yeah. the hard part. The hard part is deciding who you want to sound like. Yeah. And just looking back now, like you said that you're, you're 60 and you've written 19 books. I mean, would you, if you kind of go, can go back in a time machine, would you sit there and write 19 books again? Um, I just knowing everything that I you would, know now, the experience, all that stuff. Yeah, I would, I would change nothing because my failures allowed me to be me and I'm glad I ended up being me. So I, I love science fiction. I'm not going to fall into a time travel trap. Um, some people wake up every morning, I think you're in that, this group, and say, who can I help? Who can I teach? Where can I turn on a light? And I got to tell you, the life I've been able to lead as a teacher with this book thing, supported by my publishers, supported by my readers, 
yeah, it's been, it's been pretty good. Yeah, well, that's, that's awesome. awesome. And, you, and Chris and I, really quick, Chris and I wrote our second book. Uh, we just you know, released that a month ago, did the whole book launch. So we're very proud of it too. And, I, and again, it doesn't matter if it serves people, helps one person. That's all that matters just to get our message out there. But I'm really uh, interested to know too, just like 20 books. Like what is your, your, your method when you do this? Do you go uh, like travel like outside of like your normal environment to get this done? Do you, do you map the whole thing out like on a whiteboard? So for example, Chris, and I, when we wrote this, we went to Palm Springs for two days. We rented a condo there, <laughs> took a whole easel board, everything, and just mapped out everything and just literally shut the phones off and got it all done in two days. So I'm just interested to hear how you approach it. Well, you have a huge advantage because you have a trusted partner. Yep. Trusted partners are really rare. And usually when I'm talking to partners, I encourage them to make sure they've written up the divorce papers before they start. You guys can't even do that. So you're like, you're deep in this. And um, it's magic because you have to explain to somebody else what you mean. And that's the hardest part of writing on your own. And so, because I work in nonfiction, almost every book I've written, I've workshopped by teaching it to people first. And what you learn when you teach it to people first is when their eyes light up and when they're confused and when they're stuck and when it's fast going. And that's pedagogy. That is the art of teaching. And so in the case of the practice, I ran a workshop for 600 people that took 100 days and I saw how every single one of those people interacted with every bit of the work. And I got to tell you, I could have written 20 books way faster if I had been able to do that in the old days. Because being able to watch how people are responding to a lesson and an insight, oh, we better divide this. So I discovered genre. So I spent a lot more time on genre because people thought it was cheating when in fact it's leverage and there are two different things. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, this new book, The Practice, which comes out in November of this year. So who is this book for? Anybody who wants to ship creative work and creative work doesn't mean paintings or plays. It means something new that might not work that helps other people get better. And so if you're trying to invent jazzercise, that's creative work because before you got there, it wasn't there. And after you left, it still is. Shipping creative work is scary. Writer's block is not real, but it feels real. And Creativity feels like a burden when it should be a joy. And so this is a book for someone who's got the tactics and can't figure out why they don't use them to get honest with yourself about why you're holding back. I love that. So now what I want to do, Seth, is I want to dive into some of the, the actual you know, ideas of your new book, The Practice. And then if you could elaborate on each one and just you know, talk I'll about that, best. that'd be great. Okay, let's do it. So the first one is skill is not the same as talent. Right. So talent is what you're born with, and we have very little of it. Skill is what you choose to acquire. And in the internet age, you can get almost any skill you want. So when someone says, oh, I could never learn to juggle. Well, no, you probably could. It's just you're not willing to pay the price of dropping all those balls on the way to learning to juggle. And getting clear with yourself about what skills matter to you and what you're willing to do to, to acquire them opens the door for you to get better. I like that. And that's something I say all the time too. I, I always say, you're not good at this skill yet. Just that sure. keyword yet. And if people just bought into that and reframe their mind. Whew. Yep. <laughs> As you can see, Seth, he likes to control this whole entire interview. <laughs> you know, I can't see that. I think you're both doing no. great, but I got to tell you, he, sometimes he calls himself Chris and sometimes he calls himself Eric and it's getting very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing that you have on there in the idea is attitudes are skills. Can you elaborate on that? Right. So here's what they taught us in school. They taught us in school the only skills that matter are hard skills that you can get a grade in. And the reason they care about that is because grades are easy to give and very powerful, but they can't possibly get to know everybody. So they only teach you skills that they can test for. So fractions are a hard skill in that I can say whether or not you know this about fractions. But it's not important that you know fractions. It's important that you know honesty 
and passion and empathy and dignity. It's important that you are able to bring energy to the table and that you keep your promises and on and on. These are soft skills, real skills, skills that are hard to test for. And because of that, we don't call them skills. We call them attitudes as a way of hiding them because they don't have attitude class in third grade. They should. Third grade should be five hours of attitude every day and then two hours of hard skills. Yeah. Because if I can teach you an attitude, the rest of the stuff takes care of itself. And so if you accept that, it, you could be a little more honest. You could be a little more energetic. You could be a little more passionate. Then there's skills. And if there's skills, then that's fantastic news because it means you can go learn them. Yeah. And I think this goes back to the first question I asked you, uh, finishing the sentence, the world needs more of, you know, you said compassion. So learning these attitudes at such a young age, I think that would transfer over. Exactly. Yeah. Next one, creativity is an act of leadership. Right. So leadership is voluntary. Uh, leadership is not management. You don't get to tell people to follow you if you're a leader. Uh, and if you want to be creative, you're doing something that's never been done before and you're taking the world in a direction that's never gone. And it is voluntary for people to follow you. And therefore, you have to accept the fact that you're doing something really hard that might not work and that might make you lonely. And that's okay. Yeah. And this next one's really interesting. Leaders are imposters. Right. Yeah, that was... Okay. <laughs> so imposter syndrome. Yep. We've all heard it. Yep. And people say, how do I get rid of it? And my answer is, you can't get rid of it because you're an imposter. And so am I. Because leaders show up and say, I know what I'm doing. And creators show up and say, I think this is going to work. We're imposters. We don't know. How could we know? It's new. So what should you do when you're feeling like an imposter? One, you should congratulate yourself for not being a psychopath. Two, <laughs> congratulate yourself for doing something creative and being a leader. And three, you should say thank you. Thanks for realizing that I'm an imposter and now I'm going to dance with it because I can't make it go away. Oof, man. Seth, do you have a glass of water there? Pour it on that mic. It's on fire. <laughs> I like that though. That's good. Yeah, that one really stood out to me as well too. So thanks, elaborate on that one. The next one is um, all criticism is not the same. Correct. So I got to tell you, if either of you say you don't like my haircut, I don't care because I hardly know you. And I, while I like your hair, I'm not sure you're authorized to have an opinion on my haircut. So fine. And if someone gives me a one star review on Amazon, all they've told me is they're not the kind of person that likes books like I just wrote. They're not in a position to say, if you're on page seven, you had done this, everything would be fine because that's not the kind of critic they are. They're just acknowledging the book's not for them. That's a different kind of criticism. But when Nikki Papadopoulos, my editor, says, this title you want to give the book, I don't like it as much as I like the practice. I'm listening because she's sharing gold with me. Because Nikki Papadopoulos knows more about naming a book than I will ever know. And that kind of criticism is priceless. So you got to be really clear about which one you're listening to. Yeah. yeah. Wow. The next one, yeah. be paranoid about mediocrity. Right. So I'm mediocre at so many things because those are the things I don't care about. Because how could I invest as much as everyone else invests in each item on the agenda? Can't. Okay, fine. But on the things you do care about, don't let the masses seduce you into thinking that mediocrity is okay because that's all you got is that you are not mediocre at some things. Okay. This one stood out to me too, postponing postpone gratification. Right. So there's tension when we create something. <clears throat> if you if you listen to a not very good stand-up comic, you will notice that they don't wait long enough before the punchline. That the timing is what we're keeping track of. Mm. why don't they wait long enough? Because in that moment, there's a lot of tension about the fact that they may have just said something that was really dumb. And so just get the punchline over with and go on to the next thing. And part of what it means to be a teacher, part of what it means to be a creator is to sit with the tension, to embrace the fact that there is this moment and then there's the next part. 
And it's the spaces in between that make music work. It's the spaces in between that make fabric work. It's the spaces in between that we define our lives by. And we shouldn't rush our way through it. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a great, I love that and great point too. And then just my, my, I just want to ask upon that too, just with so many entrepreneurs and so many things being so quick and instant nowadays, right? So many people want instant gratification. Would you say that that falls in, in, in line with that as well too? Yeah. I mean, it's both because capitalism is fueled by leverage. Leverage involves opportunity costs and the time value of money. If you borrow money, you have to pay it back. The longer you keep the money, the more you have to pay back. And one of the reasons that uh, the summer and fall was so damaging for so many small businesses and big ones in 2020 is instead of having three months operating money in the bank, a lot of organizations had three days because they were leveraged to keep up with the competition. They borrowed against this and borrowed against that. And now you got to pay it all back. And so creative destruction kicks in and Schumpeter's idea that capitalism eats its own tail because Leverage leads to leverage leads to leverage, and then one day, can't do it anymore. And the thing is, capitalism's, sorry, culture's job is not to create capitalism. Capitalism's job is to enable culture. And so if it's not making your life better to be in a rush, don't be in a rush. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, um, those are some really, really good, you know, like ideas and kind of concepts that we brought up there. So I'm excited to, to dig in this book. And I hope everybody that's listening to this, you know, picks up the copy because it sounds like some really good stuff, especially right now at this critical uh, moment that we're dealing Absolutely. with all the stuff, you know, with the pandemic and everything uh, shifting. But Seth, I want to kind of move into more lifestyle questions because I'm just interested. It is called the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. And I am interested in people's habits, routine systems, all that stuff in their lifestyle. Uh, but the biggest thing I like to start off with is, what is maybe the biggest insecurity right now that you face day to day? All right. Well, I'm super privileged and super insulated and have benefited from hundreds of years of supremacy. And uh, I had great parents and I'm aware of all of that. And Many people listening to this are in a similar boat in the sense that they don't make $3 a day. They aren't uh, one day away from a healthcare crisis. And if you're in those shoes, a lot of the insecurity is invented. The insecurity is invented because we tell ourselves a story that we learned in high school, that they're talking about us at the other table, or that we're going to be discovered to be a fraud, or that everything isn't going to match the way we hope it will be tomorrow. And I have as many of those insecurities as anybody else, but I try not to invite them in for dinner. I try not to have them be my daily companion. And so my big insecurity, the one that has been with me the most, the one I have invited in is that I won't do enough tomorrow, mm. that I won't contribute enough. Yeah. Beautiful. It and that's, yeah, that's just, it's just hearing that too. I mean, after everything you've accomplished, you know what I mean? And just to still think that like, you know, that you still have not brought enough to the table. Not even close. Yeah. yeah. And that's something we always, you know, tell to our, our students is like, there's no finish line in this. There's no end product. You know, it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And there's never going to be a day where you're going to probably sit there and wake up and say, I accomplished everything or I served enough. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's really refreshing to hear that, you know, at somebody your stature and everything you've accomplished. Yeah. It's an infinite game. So what, what are you craving more of right now in your life? Well, as you know, porcelana uh, cacao beans were extinct for many years and they discovered just two trees on the border of uh, Peru and Colombia. And now they're breeding more of it. But there's not nearly enough porcelana, 75% dark chocolate in my life. I'm just saying. Um, and mostly it's, an, it's about enrollment. How do we create an environment where more people realize they've got a shot? realize that they could learn a skill, realize they could make things better. That I have figured out that when I'm surrounded by people who are enrolled, my life is so much better than when I have to persuade people to enroll. Yep. Yeah. I'm with you. And what would but you say, Seth? Dark chocolate is also good. Yeah. <laughs> um, team dark chocolate. <laughs> 
Seth, what would you say brings out like maybe like your dark side or like your killer instinct or your relentless side? And the analogy I'd like to give is just um, if anybody watched the last dance with the Michael Jordan um, series, I don't know if you watched that, but after seeing 10 episodes of that guy, that guy was just um, literally an example of just cutthroat and just killer instinct and just relentless, you know, and I know every entrepreneur has a side of that, you know, it's, it's different dosages, but you know, what brings out that, that side of you? I am about as different from him as I think I could be. Uh, there are times playing Scrabble that I have behaved poorly. Um, but in general, like so the last time I was in a poker game, it was a weekly game with some creatives. The first week I won 20 bucks, which was a lot. And the second week, uh, I started splitting the pot with people before the hand was over. And the third week, they asked me not to come back because they said the point of poker is to win. And I didn't enjoy winning. I just wanted to tie. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about investments. Chris and I are huge on investing in ourselves, you know, uh, just education wise on our business to get better, you know, as people, you know, skill sets, everything. So what has been the best investment, you know, you've made in the last five years? Well, you know, for the people who are listening to this, what do you think is in it for Eric and Chris to make a podcast? And I would argue the two of you get more out of this podcast than anybody who's listening to it. And you don't get things out of it because it gets you new clients, though it might get you a couple of new clients. What you get out of it is you get to make a podcast and it has all these ripple effects for other people. Um, so 20 plus years ago when I started blogging every day, there's no question I've read my blog more than anybody else, but it's also true that I've gotten more out of my blog than anybody else. The act of writing it itself, even if no one read it, is just a magical gift. And so um, I think we get a little confused when we say investing in ourselves because that brings to mind money. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is how do you set your brain up for a chemical organization that lets you feel like a better version of yourself. And so part of that is, you know, did you go swimming? And a big part of it is, did you help an old lady cross the street today? Because that feeling, you got as much out of it as she did. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And really quick, I have to just uh, elaborate on the question that you said, what do Chris and Eric get out of this podcast? And I think that's great what you said and the ripple effect and absolutely agree. But again, we get to interview amazing, influential people like you, Seth. And a lot of people might not realize it, but this is like an hour's worth of, of wisdom. And it, it's irreplaceable. And for me to sit here and, and spend an hour of my day and interview you, that's priceless. You know, well, and maybe some people don't see you. it that way. Yeah. Back at you. Thanks. Yeah. I, I also think, Seth, that he likes showing his uh, big caterpillar eyebrows on the screen too to a lot of people. So I think that's what he likes to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy. <laughs> I'm a minute younger. I got to give him some jabs. Seth. If this doesn't work out, you can always go into stand up together. Absolutely. We got backup plans. <laughs> I'm over here in Los Angeles. I've seen stand up, and there's no way I can do that. So kudos <laughs> to those people. But, Seth, um, you know, I want to talk about like the day to day stuff that you do. Like, you know, ever since that we've been kind of like locked down, and let's just say maybe four months, we'll call it, um, has there anything that's been changing like in your day to day, like just systems, habits, anything like that in your lifestyle? <clears throat> I am not, um, I'm not super process oriented the way a lot of people who blog about that stuff are. Instead, I have really strict rule, willpower rules so I don't have to reconsider. Like, I haven't eaten wheat in 20 years. I haven't eaten meat in 30 years. I just don't even think about it. Right, that when Seinfeld went off the air, the television in my house disappeared for 20 years or whatever it was because I just don't want to think about it. And um, I don't have a blog tomorrow because I have a good idea, I have a blog tomorrow because it's tomorrow. And so you make that idea once and then you're done. Uh, so yeah, lots of little habits unthought through have changed in my life because I haven't seen another human in person except for a very small circle of people. Um, but the narrative of my day 
I haven't given myself permission to change that very much. Gotcha. What's next for Seth Godin? This isn't enough. Sheesh, you sound like me. <laughs> I see a lot more going forward. Uh, you know, the, I was in the CD-ROM business. I was in the email business. I was in the internet business. I was in the book packaging business. I made a movie that Cisco and Ebert gave two thumbs up to. So I played in lots of forms of media. And um, I don't keep track of it that way anymore. I keep track of, uh, does this belong next to the things that came before it? Mm -hmm. And what the practice has taught me is that there's a lot of work to be done in helping people feel seen, in creating systems of dignity, of uh, opening the door for people. And so I'm probably doing stuff like that for the foreseeable future. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So Seth, before I ask the last question, kind of conclude this um, conversation, I just want to take a minute to commend you. And again, th say thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Thank uh, you so really, much, Chris. Yeah, it's really been an honor, like, you know, getting to talk to you. Like, like Eric said, been big fans of like your work have consumed a lot of your books. I don't know about all 19, but probably about 10 of them. And we'll, oh, yeah. definitely, we'll definitely read number 19 for sure. Um, but thank you so much for everything you've done. You've made a in, huge impact on us. I know you've made a huge impact on whether people are listening to this or not. So thank you so much. Thanks. I echo that too. <laughs> Coffee cut. So Seth, you know, for the last question, you know, what does it mean to Seth Godin to live a dynamic lifestyle? Well, I play with words for a living and, you know, static electricity is really good for uh, magic tricks when you rub the balloon and it sticks to the wall. But there are very few things in our life where static is what we're looking for. Uh, static friction isn't the same as rolling friction and becoming static or having static on your radio, but none of those things are good. So what it means to be dynamic is to say, none of it's permanent. As Chang Young Trump and Rinpoche used to say, uh, the good news is we are falling, falling, falling down an infinitely deep well. And the bad news is there's nothing to hold on to. Hmm. And that's actually the good news. Because since there's nothing to hold on to, we get to realize static is an illusion. And that fighting to keep things the same isn't nearly as productive as figuring out how to make things better. Yeah. Wow. Way to conclude that. Powerful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So where, what, what can we support you on and the listeners and where can they find a new copy of the book, The Practice? So if you go to Seth.blog slash The Practice, you'll find out a lot about it. Uh, there's 7,000 blog posts there. After you read them all, let me know and I'll write some more. Uh, <laughs> and the workshops we run are at akimbo.com, A-K-I-M-B-O. The Alt-MBA is our flagship, but there are new ones all the time. And uh, if you are enrolled in this journey, I hope we can help you get there. Amazing. We will have all that linked up in the show notes. Guys, please go see everything that Seth Godin is doing. Pick up a copy of his new book, The Practice. Once again, Seth, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the ruckus, you guys make it. Thanks, really Seth. Matters. We'll all right, guys. Until next time. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video and another episode on pro tips on living a dynamic lifestyle. We truly appreciate it. Hopefully you got a lot of value out of it. If you're interested in getting more value like this from these pro tips, make sure to subscribe above. We're going to be dropping these daily. Also, if you are a fitness professional and you're looking to create more income, impact, influence, and independence, we just dropped our new book, Rise of the Fit Pros, so you guys can do all of that. And you can also start building your hybrid training model of in-person and online training. So make sure to click the link or the book right here to grab your guys' copy and we'll send it over to you. Other than that, we're out. Talk to you soon.